it's time for the big conversations telling stories of movers and shakers of industry giants and daring professionals it's time for the conversations that change your perspective on life the kind of conversations that shape entrepreneurs and move careers forward if you don't know where these conversations are found we are sending you a gps but if you're listening to this voice right now you are here Welcome to the Growth Podcast. This is the GPS. All right, welcome to another exciting episode of the Growth Podcast. We're here with another interesting conversation. Uh, thank you for the support you've been giving the podcast so far. And uh, today we're having another um, very informative conversation. Uh, my guest comes with a wealth of experience, and I know that you will draw value uh, from this conversation. My guest is the Chief Executive Officer at KPMG. KPMG is one of the big four auditing firms in the world, obviously one of the big four here in Zambia as well. Uh, Mr. Jason Kazilimani, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. No, a pleasure is ours to host you. Um, and thank you to her for making it possible. Um, well, we we have these cards. They are a tradition on the podcast. Um, okay. So please pick any four. Um, in any order, you can pick very any nervous about uh, this. <laughs> any four. You know, pick any four. Um, Do I have to flip them? No, 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 no. Just pick any four. Okay. In any particular order. I'm, I'm happy you're not even looking at them. <laughs> yeah, any four. All right, Too give blue. me the rest. Okay. All right, cool. So every card has a question. Just read mm -hmm. the question and then give us an answer. Okay, the first one is, what book has had a profound impact on your life and why? Wow, this is a tough one, eh? Uh, tough because I've read uh, so many books in the hundreds. But I think one that will always have an impact on my life is obviously the, the holy book, the Bible, I think, because it's got a lot of um, life principles. There's one particular uh, version of the Bible that I, I bought, which is the John C. Maxwell Bible and uh, the, the Leadership Bible. And uh, so John C. Maxwell, I'm sure you've heard of him. Yeah. yeah. Yes, he... He dissected the Bible and looked at um, uh, the various characters in the Bible, analyzed their leadership skills or lack thereof. Um, and I find that uh, it's something that is very useful up to now. It's always there at my bedside. And I look at okay. it from time to time. As I said, it's a tough question because I've read a lot of books, but this one I think is has had an impact on my life because it shapes you. Uh, talks to your values, it talks about how you should conduct yourself, and so on and so forth. It basically talks about common sense. It's got a very common sense approach to, uh, to life. And that's what the Bible is, I think. All right, let's go to the next one. Next, uh, what beliefs would you want to pass on to your children or grandchildren? Hmm. Okay, first of all, uh, belief in God. Uh, God uh, exists. Um, other beliefs, are, it's a tough question, this one. Eh? <laughs> uh, okay, let me talk about values. I wish the question was slightly different. But okay, I, I, I believe that um, 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 everyone should be given a, a fair chance uh, on this world. Um, everyone should work hard, uh, put in their best in whatever it is that they do. Um, I strongly believe um, that everyone should be treated uh, fairly, whatever the case. Um, I strongly believe that uh, people should speak out when there's something wrong that's going on. Uh, I read somewhere that evil prevails when good men do nothing. And I use the word men loosely here. Obviously, when I use the masculine gender, I'm including the feminine gender uh, as well. So those are some of the beliefs I think I would like to pass on to my children and grandchildren. Uh, the other one is, I think, on the importance of uh, starting off very early, um, thinking about your financial stability in the future, your financial independence. I think that's pretty key. Uh, the importance of, uh, of cash flows. I always say cash is king. You can have so many assets, but if you don't have cash, you cannot convert them to cash. It won't be easy for you. So there's so many. Okay. Don't get me started. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> let's go to number three. Number three is uh, how do you best receive uh, uh, criticism? It's a tough one because uh, 
sometimes criticism does sting. Uh, it pains. Huh? You think you're doing uh, pretty well, and then someone points out, uh, actually, on this score, you didn't do too well. And uh, it can be all sorts of criticism. It can be criticism in, in family circles, maybe the way you handle a situation. Uh, it could be criticism in the professional sense. Uh, for example, you've not complied with a particular standard, whatever it is that you're doing, an accounting standard or an auditing standard. Criticism does sting, but I think the best is to uh, uh, take it, no matter how much it stings, take it on the chin, roll with the punch, and then look at the message that's being delivered. Don't look at the person delivering the criticism. Instead, look at the message that they're actually delivering. Because sometimes we get, uh, it gets clouded, you know. Someone gives you a, a very constructive feedback, not feedback, but because because of the 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 the, the, the person that is uh, actually delivering the message, it gets clouded, and you think it's it's all bad, it's all wrong, they're all out to get me, and so on and so forth. So I always say, look at the message, don't look at the messenger. Never shoot the messenger. Look at the message, receive the message, and act on it. Because no matter how uh, well it's uh, or badly it's put, sometimes people say. No, but uh, you've criticized this person, but you could have done it in a different way. You could have been gentle, could have been hard, and so on and so forth. Whatever the case, whether it's uh, delivered with kid gloves uh, or with tough love in a tough manner, always look at the message and act on uh, the issue that has been raised. All right. The last one? Last one. Um, what would you like to re-experience because you do not appreciate it fully the first time. <laughs> okay, let me think about this. What would you like to re-experience because you don't appreciate fully uh, the first time? I guess, I think this has got to be something from uh, things that happen in, in childhood, okay, uh, where you're given a task to do uh, by your mother uh, or your father, and you don't really like it, but it's actually for your own good. Okay, I'll tell you what, I did not like mathematics at all at school, uh, arithmetic, right from grade one all the way up to okay. from five or grade 12. Um, but I think I'd like to re-experience it, because maybe it would uh, give me a different perspective uh, on life, and on why you should actually embrace some things that you actually don't like. Uh, because the, the irony is, here I am, I didn't like maths, but <laughs> the job I do Every has day. to do with uh, numbers. So if I'd embraced it much earlier, maybe I'd have been a much, much better accountant than I am at the moment. Mm, your CEO, I mean, how high can you go? <laughs> 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 no, at least you've seen the questions weren't that bad. Or that well, was complicated. They got me thinking. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's the, yeah, that's the, that's the whole idea. They, they, they make you look within yourself. But, but for the sake of those that may not uh, know you, how do you describe Jason Kazilimani? Well, I think I'm a pretty um, straightforward person. Um, I think what you see is what you get. Uh, people say I wear my heart on my sleeve. That's probably true. Um, I do try to... I control it, but sometimes it comes out because I, I like to speak my mind, and I think it's uh, it's hereditary. Uh, it's in the genes. Uh, when you look at my father, my late father, my my late uncle, my father's bloodline, all very frank uh, people, very straightforward people. Uh, my mom's side of the family, more quiet, more balanced, softer. There are a few hotheads there as well, uh, but I think if you ask a lot of people, that's probably the description that they'll, they'll give you. Some will probably say he's got a short fuse, but it's, it's, it's not really the, the case where he's aggressive, but that's not really true. I, I prefer to say um, I'm assertive and say it as it is. Uh, perhaps it's the way it comes out sometimes. Maybe it may come out a bit too strong and may end up... Uh, making some people uncomfortable or scaring them. But there's never, ever any ill intention, ever. It's always uh, done in a very, very good good spirit. 
that's one was one aspect uh, of the public face that people see. But the the rural Jason is actually very very quiet, uh, introverted, um, pretty private person. Um, I like to say that I'm an extroverted introvert, but the baseline Jason Kazilimani is actually uh, an introvert. Uh, mom used to tell me, if you ask my mom, she says, oh, I'm the kind of guy who would uh, keep himself busy the whole day with his books, no trouble with anyone, and so on and so forth. Uh, but I think the thing is, as you develop in life, you've got to develop these other, other skills and go out a bit, a bit more. So yeah, it may sound like a confusing answer, but I think that's that's the best answer I can give you. All right. <laughs> Tell me about your, your your education. Okay, I started my. Um, I didn't go to preschool. Eh? I started right straight from grade one. Uh, I don't know what happened. My mother then was teaching at um, uh, in Kawe, uh, Lukanga Primary School. It used to be called Parker Boys. School. Parker Boys and then changed to Lukanga Primary School, but then it was no longer a boys' school, it was uh, co education. So she took me along to school one day, uh, I think it was in the third term uh, in grade one. So I was there for about two weeks, three weeks, but then I started grade one proper the following year at uh, what was then called the Dominican Convent School in Kawe. Yeah. I think it's now called Caritas, but uh, the convent school, they used to allow boys up to grade four. You go into grade one, you reach grade four, they kick you out. They figured at the age of 10, boys are becoming a bit too naughty. So then grade five to seven, I went to uh, Neem Tree Primary School in Cabo as well. And then for my form one to form five, or grade eight to grade 12, if you like, it was at St. Paul's um, uh, Secondary School, uh, outside Cabo, boarding school for boys. It was a boys only school then, but, but it's now uh, uh, co-ed. And then after that, I went to the uh, Accountancy Training College in Jingola under a ZCM scholarship uh, to study uh, accounting. Yeah, so that's what I've done. Uh, subsequent to that, I've done other things like, you know, your, uh, MBAs and stuff like that from University of East London and so on. Um, trying to work on a doctorate at the moment. A bit tough, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah, so that's me in a, in a nutshell, the formal uh, education. All right. What's with CEOs in Zambia and getting masters from the UK? Well, I know a number of them. Well, it's not only from the UK. A lot of them get them from other universities, Zambian universities, you know, UNSA, CBU, uh, Unilas. I guess at that time, uh, we didn't have so many universities uh, in Zambia then. Um, and I got my MBA when I was in Nigeria, by the way. I wasn't uh, in Zambia. So I, 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 I started with the London School of Business and Finance under the University of, uh, of East London. But I guess uh, to answer your question, uh, because uh, Zambia was a, a British colony, I think the, 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 the automatic choice for most people is to go the British way, go to a British university. Okay. But there are a lot of others who go elsewhere. America, I've got friends who've been to Harvard and stuff like that. Yeah. All right. Um, you are a CEO now, but obviously every career has those humble beginnings, you know. Um, how was it starting out your career? I started off, um, my first job was with uh, ZTCM, the old ZTCM, or the real ZTCM, yeah. as, as old time as I like to call it, Zambia Consolidated Copper Mines. And this was because, um, as I said, I was on a ZTCM scholarship. So every uh, semester, uh, would be posted to the various operating divisions to get work experience. And upon finishing level two of ACC then, I was posted to um, uh, Operation Center, the Accounting and Finance Department uh, of uh, ZTCM, then Operation Center, at Muton it was at Mutondo House uh, in Ketwe. And my first job was in the Group Accounting Unit, and I was, my title was Capital Accountant for Consolidation. So I used to consolidate all the fixed assets schedules for the ZCM divisions and also help in uh, preparing the consolidated financial statements for the ZCM group. ZCM was a really big entity then, apart from its operating divisions. It also had a number of subsidiaries all over the world, uh, you know, the likes of Belembe Drilling uh, uh, and so on and so forth, associates like Memaco and so on and so forth. So those were, those were my, um, uh, my early years. I was there for uh, two years. 
uh, before uh, moving to uh, KPMG uh, in the Kitwe office. And I joined KPMG as a trainee, as a trainee, right? So I, I've been through the mill. <laughs> <laughs> From training to CEO. Yes. What was your attitude like, you know, as a trainee? Um, because also uh, for, for most people, when you are at entry level, you've got this hope, this ambition, this what, which sometimes begins to, you know, cloud your judgment. And you see most young people don't even last in these jobs. You find trainee, they manage you out. And it just ends there, you don't go anywhere. I think my attitude was one of learning, going to learn, and to apply myself all the time. You know, be, try to be the best you can be. There's a lot of hard work. Um, I think my wife probably called me a workaholic, in my early days especially. It was a lot of long hours. So I applied myself, read a lot, uh, researched, and tried to volunteer for several tasks. For example, uh, volunteering to become one of the trainers in the office. So who's going to be a trainer? I would like to be a trainer. You are sent off to uh, Center of Excellence in South Africa for two, three week course. You come back and then roll out the training to the, uh, to the others. So it's a question of application. I think that's, that's what I did and put in a lot of work, a lot of hard work. Uh, it was tough. It wasn't easy. Uh, and switching from industry uh, to auditing it required a bit of a, a major um, uh, shift in the mind. Uh, but we, we, we got over it. Uh, it, it was good in that I had um, some very good bosses. I think uh, our partner in Kit Office then was um, uh, Larry Peary, uh, and uh, he gave all of us the opportunity to really uh, develop ourselves. Uh, I had uh, managers supervising me like um, uh, Kelvin Kaluba, and also uh, Henry Nondo. Henry Nondo later became a partner at EY. Uh, so it, it, it was a great team. It was a great team. And the guys I was working with as well were also wanted to work. It was a small team, but we all pushed each other, uh, each other uh, up the ladder. All right. And w how was your relationship with, with other people that you found there? Because, and why I ask is because uh, sometimes it's not really about the work, but I talked about attitude. But then also there's a question of how do you relate with those that you work with, um, maybe those in other departments, those above you, those below you. And that then begins to form your character in the organization. I think the work relationship was pretty good. Um, as I said, it was a good team and uh, it was open. We all worked together with each other. We tried to be honest and open in our communication at all times. And I think that's what helped us create a, a good, uh, solid team uh, that, you know, shut out the lights when it came to, uh, to, to delivery. So it was, a, it was a good working environment, uh, good relations, um, helping each other out, um, volunteering to help other, others when they're under pressure, because you know that when you're, when you're under pressure, they'll come through to help you out as well. All right. You obviously got promoted a number of times because you're CEO. What, what do you think is the distinction between those that get promoted and those that remain where they are? Because there are some people um, who maybe you found them at this level. Ten years later, they're still at that level. They want to go up, but nothing's happening. I think it's attitude. I think that's a key thing. Uh, attitude and uh, application. At a certain level, you're basically all the same. Uh, academically, you're the same. Uh, and some uh, in school probably have done much better than you did, uh, got better marks than you did, uh, probably even uh, finished their qualifications much earlier than you did. But it all comes down to the application and the attitude, okay? Um, and the passion uh, to succeed. Uh, going the extra mile and not just working nine to five, not just doing the minimum to get paid and to avoid being fired. <laughs> I think that's the difference. The difference is uh, self-improvement uh, all the time, uh, reading a lot, researching a lot, and also the higher up you go, the, the more the, the softer skills become important, much more important than the, the, the technical skills, because technical skills will be taken as a given. But if you're gonna uh, move up, your soft skills, your interpersonal skills uh, need to be honed. You need to start developing social capital, uh, political capital, 
in the corporate environment uh, uh, space as well, because you need it uh, sometimes. So in summary, it's application, uh, it's passion, it's being um, uh, teachable, it's being humble, accepting that there's some things you do not know. Uh, if you are annoyed at all, you won't get far because people will just back away. Uh, but so you need to be a, like a sponge where you absorb a lot uh, and listen to everyone's contribution. Some contributions will be valuable right from the start to be like a light bulb. Others will take you a while to sift through. And others you think actually it's useless, but in retrospect, you find actually it's not that useless because this garbage that I, that I heard makes me realize what is actually garbage and what is a real gem. Okay, so it's important to listen to people, uh, but it's also important to get your voice heard, get your views heard. Don't crouch in a corner like a tortoise and be scared of uh, conflict. Don't fear conflict. Know how to manage conflict. If there are issues that should be brought up and discussed, and conflict can come from anywhere. It can come from your superiors, uh, your peers, and your juniors as well. So it's things like that. It's about managing relationships. It's very key. Technical skills is, is given. You've got to be up to date. If you're an accountant, make sure you're up to date on the accounting standards. If you're an auditor, up to date on the, both the accounting standards and the auditing standards and anything else in between. Okay, so those are given. But the other things you have to develop, as I said, social skills. Networking as well, because uh, it's about growing a business. Uh, you need to be out there in the market. You need to know people, because at the end of the day, people buy from other people. They won't buy from a, a company. Ah, they'll buy from people. Here I am. Uh, I, was, I was invited to, oh, Suwiland, you'd like to have a chat with your podcast. Oh, sure, I know Suwiland. He's a great guy. I'm not going to go there. If it's someone else who's less palatable, I'd have said, ah, no, no thanks. I think I've got uh, other things to, uh, to sort out. Maybe we'll discuss some other time. So that's important. And also we all need to work on um, developing our own, our own brands. Don't have a big brand like Nike or Coca-Cola, but your own little brand. You should be known for something that's good, whether it's there in your own office uh, or in the wider marketplace or at church, at the mosque, synagogue, temple, wherever it is that you worship, in the spiritual world, or anywhere, anywhere else. You should be known for something good. Yeah? If you, if you, if, if, if you are uh, good at organizing um, events, people should know that's the best event organizer. If you're a good public speaker, they say, oh, this guy is a good public speaker. Let's bring him on as a facilitator or as a director of programs, or stuff like that. If you're good technically, if you're good in, say, IFRS 9, or reverse VAT, <laughs> uh, or wind for taxes, people should come to you. That, that's a go-to guy. Let's ask him about wind for taxes. Let's ask him about uh, what's the best tax regime uh, for the mines. You should be known for something. Uh, you cannot be a jack of all trades. You can be a general practitioner, yes? At a certain level, you, you must know a bit about everything. But at one stage, people should know you about should know something about you to say that's a great guy or a great uh, lady to go to for this, that, or the other. So right. apply yourself. Yeah. So, so you've talked about how you get promoted, but how do you deal with getting passed over for promotion? Because for some people, it then messes with their psyche, their productivity goes down because they're discouraged. Yeah. It's the third time, you have missed opportunity again. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, um, I think a few, when I was a trainee, uh, there was a time when um, uh, we were in our Kido office, and the other people were in our Lusaka office. We heard that the guys in Lusaka had been promoted, so we asked, but why, what about us? So actually, you, you guys, you didn't do your assessments. I said, but who's supposed to? He said, no, it's up to you to push to your assessments. So if you're going to be passed over, find out why. It could be that... Uh, it's really something that you did not do rather than someone actively passing you over or someone acting with malice. Okay, so find out, okay, I've been passed over. Where do I need to develop? Okay, and it's up to you now to engage with your, your mentors. Some organizations have official mentors. 
some of performance managers. For example, in my firm, we've got performance managers. You engage the performance manager to say, look, uh, my last assessment didn't go too well. What exactly did I do wrong? What's the feedback from the people I work with? And have an open and frank discussion uh, about uh, what's not happening and what you need to do to make it right. So you've got to take, uh, yeah, I think that's the word, responsibility. Take responsibility over your own career. Be responsible. Do not play the whinge game. Do not say, ah, the others are being favored. Ah, no, the others are, it's the boss's blue-eyed boy or blue-eyed girl and so on and so forth. Uh, or, you know, it's, it's, it's other issues. Ah, take responsibility. And if you do and develop an action plan, you surely come to the top. Because they say cream always rises to the top. You cannot keep a good man down. You cannot keep a good woman down. You can't. You just can't. No matter, no, if, if you're performing well, people will notice. They cannot ignore you. You will not be ignored. Refuse to be ignored. Take responsibility for your own career. Do what needs to be done to improve your own standing. Whether it's additional uh, training, uh, additional uh, research, uh, going to improve your qualifications, uh, you know, upgrading qualifications, whatever it is, uh, or even talking to people, building social and political capital uh, in your organization in the marketplace. Go out and let people know who you are and what you're capable of doing. Put your hand up, uh, uh, volunteer for assignments, even the least sexy assignments. Volunteer, people will notice. Okay. Yeah. I've asked this question to other CEOs. I'd to get your take on it. Yeah. There are times when um, you're passed over for promotion, right? Mm. And uh, someone, okay, for example, let's say there's, okay, maybe let me use KPMG as an example. Let's say there's an audit manager, for example, um, and I'm acting in the role of audit manager for a significant period of time. And I'm very sure I'm going to get it. Yeah. And then someone else comes from another firm and their audit manager. And I go back to my substantive position and I now have to report to this audit manager. How do you manage that? Because one, the audit manager obviously will find out that you were acting, you wanted this job. So now you've got some sort of like rift between you and that person. How do you still, you know, I don't know if it's an attitude problem. How do you still manage an environment like that? Okay, I think this is where honesty and openness in communication comes through. And also the importance of having a, a very robust performance appraisal system. So that people will know, they should be told where they're doing well, where they're not doing well, what their development points are, what their good points are. And they should be frankly told that uh, if they're not ready for promotion, they should be told they're not ready for promotion, and they should be told why they're not ready for, for promotion. So it should come as no surprise if someone else comes in from either from the same department, or some unit, or even from someone from another firm coming in and uh, you know coming into a position higher than higher than the, uh, they're at. Um, it's about being on, open and honest, and having an appraisal system that's uh, transparent. That's always a that's always a challenge, I think, uh, because people who are promoted will tend to blame the system. So there's this favoritism in the system, or I was overlooked, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, you need to put your best foot forward, and the leadership as well needs to make sure that uh, uh, the path to the top is well laid out, uh, articulated, and explained to everyone. And should not just be stuck in a, a staff handbook. You take the time to talk to people from time to time what it takes to rise to the top, what it takes to make a partner. You tell them every once in a while. And then tell them, okay, before you do this, you've got to do this, and you've got to perform at this. So the more you talk to people, the more transparent you are, the more people will accept it. And some will just basically walk out and say, I think this is not the place for me. Uh, I think I've reached my limit. I don't think I can reach those standards you, uh, you want. And they'll walk away amicably. Others will stay on, and sure enough, they'll rise up and get the cake that they're looking for, that they want. Okay, you've, you've dealt a lot with managing people. What, what do you think are the challenges of managing people in an organization? And how can a manager really get the best out of his subordinates? Managing people's expectations, um, managing uh, people's um, uh, emotions, and also helping to manage the perceptions that they have of what is there at the top and how you get to the top. 
those are some of the key uh, uh, issues. As I said, and it, at the end of the day, little things boils down to communication and also training. Uh, people need to be adequately trained uh, and given the resources that you're asking them to, for the jobs you're asking them to execute. If you're going to get someone to be a, an expert on, I don't know, internal control, financial reporting, or ESG issues, give them the exposure. Send them to an office to learn those skills. Uh, get them accredited. Give them the training. Give them the tools, the technology. That's the best way of doing it. Professional services firms are, 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 are knowledge businesses, and dealing with knowledge workers is very tricky. Yeah, because knowledge workers can up and go. You're not getting someone who's going to make a car or bake some bread. You're talking about someone's, you're using someone's knowledge to, to deliver a service. And they've got to be motivated as much as possible. You've got to uh, uh, understand the signs of burnout. You've got to know when someone is actually crying out for help. When you see someone's performance dipping, is it because he or she uh, is lazy? Or is it uh, the client giving the problems? Or are they just burnt out? Do they need a break? Do we need to uh, share their burden? Do we need to bring in more, more staff? Now, all these are very difficult because bringing staff uh, is difficult because the Zambian market, the skills, for example, in our industry, financial, uh, professional services industry, they're limited. A lot of people, a lot of firms have lost people. They've gone out of the country, uh, Europe, Australia, America. It happens all the time. If you ask any other managing partner of any firm in Zambia, they'll tell you exactly the same thing. Staff recruitment, staff retention is the biggest hurdle. So to keep people motivated and engaged uh, is a big issue, uh, which people in leadership need to uh, address uh, all the time. That's a very, very key, uh, key thing. But as I said, uh, the more we engage with people, the more we talk to them, the more we train them, the more we explain the... Uh, the path uh, to, to leadership or to higher positions, the better for everyone. Uh, obviously, there's, uh, there's the hygiene factors, muscle or hierarchy of needs. Yeah. You've got to give people a decent, um, a decent wage, which is tough in these economic conditions where uh, our clients are all trying to cut costs. Okay? And uh, the softest costs they can think about are things like consulting fees, uh, audit fees, they really haggle hard on those. So your revenue is not growing as high as you want it to grow, but you recognize that you need to uh, pay your staff more, give them better conditions. So the margins are shrinking. Yeah, so that's, that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a key practical uh, issue that everyone in my position uh, has to face. When you look back at your career, what, what, what mistakes did you make in the past and what did you learn from them? Uh, mistakes, obviously people don't like to acknowledge or admit <laughs> mistakes, but we all make mistakes. Um, uh, personally, well, I don't know. Maybe I've been, may have been a bit too hard on some people. I don't know. Uh, but it's something I've uh, learned to uh, work on. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a tough one, eh? It's a tough one. It's what really mistakes do you, you obviously sit at the top. What mistakes do you see young people making as they want to rise in their career? What mistakes do you see them making? Okay. For the current generation, it's uh, impatience. But I understand it's a generational issue. We have this debate all the time. Uh, the, what, what do we call the youngest guys now? Millennials? Gen Z, isn't it? Gen Z, yes. The attention span is... Um, is shorter. The people in my generation would stay in the same place for 10 years, 15, 20, 29, 30. For the young generation, for them to stay even for three years, that's a long time. So I think they want to get things done much, much quicker. They want to tick off some boxes much, much quicker. And uh, get to the top much quicker than others. So not that it's a bad thing. It is a good thing, actually, to be ambitious. And they tend to be more innovative, which is true. Uh, more tech savvy, which is true. Uh, but the, the, um, the negative side 
is or well, not negative, but the downside is that uh, they tend to be a bit too impatient sometimes, in my perspective, and will actually leave and go to the next opportunity even before they are fully baked, even before they are fully ready. They will leave a place half-baked and go on to another job, and then they find themselves not ready to handle where they've gone. And then that's when you find some of them actually coming back. Okay, so I would like to see a bit more patience, just a couple more years, two, three years more, to get them ready to the next stage. No one is going to hold them back, uh, but it's best that they, before they, they, they move, they're actually ready to move, and they should know in the house that they should move. They should also, I think, uh, take time uh, to talk to their mentors and get a bit of guidance on when they should move and where they should move to, and not just move with the flow. I think that's one mistake that I, I see happening from, from time to time, people moving when they're actually not ready. If they're still not a bit more, when they move, they'll really explode on impact wherever it is that uh, they're going. You're a CEO. When you sit down and look at someone's CV, and in, and in six years they've been in four companies, are you likely to hire that person? Well, it depends on what the job is. Okay, Obviously, if it's uh, something to do with, say, innovation, uh, the guys who do innovation, IT, and so on, you expect them to move much more regularly. Okay, But then the question has got to be asked that uh, if you've moved four times in six years, what, what is that you're looking for? It could be the person not yet settled. Maybe the person actually read, obtained the wrong qualification. It's not who they are. And they feel uncomfortable being an accountant or an auditor. Maybe they should have been a lawyer or a marketer uh, or an interior designer. These things happen. Because some people do the, take the wrong qualification, maybe because of pressure from their parents or peers, or that's the only thing that was available. And so they, they feel unsettled. And so it's clear that this is not their thing. And then when they do move to where they should be, where their calling is, you see them really flourish. And we've seen that happen from time to time, quite a number of times. I'll give you an example. My, my own wife started off as an accountant. But she's not really an accountant. It's not really her. But what she does now, uh, dealing with people issues, psychology issues, and also her side houses like interior design and so on, she fl she's flourished. She really flourishes. Okay. Yeah. When you interview someone, you know, you walk in, what tells you that this is a candidate we're looking for? Okay. If I was, um, if I'm in a prophetic mode, I would say, yeah, this is the one. I'm just, I know. God has told me this is the one. But yeah, we're not all prophets. So <laughs> <laughs> it all boils down to the conversation that you'll have with them. Okay. And first of all, there are things like the baseline, you know, for, for and, and I'll talk about my own uh, profession. Baseline, someone has got to be able to um, write a report. Okay, so the first thing you look at is, well, let's see your, your results in uh, O-level uh, English, your results in O-level maths. Well, those are baseline things that it gives you an indication or whether or not someone uh, is suitable. And then you talk to them, you engage with them. Okay, you challenge them. Well, where do you see yourself um, five, 10, 15 years from now? What do you really want to do? And what's your plan for that? And how does coming here fit in with your own plan for where you want to be in 20 years' time? Okay, so obviously some won't have the answers right there and then because they've actually never thought about it. But in engaging with them, you'll be able to tell whether or not someone has got the ability to think about it. They'll start scratching their head. Okay, I think I'll do that. I think I'll do that. You can see that they're actually thinking about it. Others may be totally blank. Others won't be able to string together uh, a couple of co coherent sentences. Then you know that this, this is not the, the place for this person. Yeah. So what's, it's, what's, it's things like that. What's your favorite question to ask in an interview? Well, I like to throw curveballs, and uh, to be honest, I don't uh, 
I've not interviewed a lot of people in a long while. Most of the people I interview now are at the high level, people coming at the high level recruits rather than the, at, the, at the low level. But uh, I would ask and I always ask, well, what, who are you? Tell me who you are. Don't tell me what's your qualification. I want to know who you are, Sui Lanji, Siame. Who are you? What makes you? And what impact do you want to have on this firm and on the nation of Zambia? Simple, basic questions. So that will cut through a lot of things. And how that person answers that question, and I always encourage them to be as uh, frank and open and relaxed as possible. Take all the time they need to frame the answers during the interview. That will give me a really good feel for whether that person is suitable uh, or not. Right. You're able to um, catch out people talking nonsense or fluff or waffling. It comes out easily. But if someone is telling the truth, looking you in, in the eye, you'll know. And you'll be able to know Fine, they may have shortcomings based on what they said, but I think this person is sincere. I think this person, looking at their results, their CV, their experience, and their attitude and their manner they're engaging with me, I think this person is someone we can actually mold into someone really great. Okay. How, how, how can I improve? Um, I know you talk about communication, but there are some times that people have that momentum when they're starting out. But over time, you find that, you know, it's sort of like becoming lukewarm, it's becoming cold. Not because they're deliberately doing it, but there are a lot of factors that contribute to that. You know, maybe something they're dealing with in, at home or something like that. But they really want to give their all to the organization. How do I improve performance so that I still remain at my best? I think people give people um, uh, different experiences. Look, this is my 30th year uh, with the same firm. I wouldn't have lasted this long if I didn't have different experiences, okay? I joined KPMG in 1st of July, 1994. Yes, 1994. In the first four years, I was in our Keto office. During that time, I'll tell you, after two years, I really qualified, I said, ah, after two years, I think I'm gonna leave. I'll find a job in industry and so on and so forth. But then, uh, my bosses, Larry Peary said, oh, Jason, I'm sending you to Pongo Development Company for three, four months, three months, you're gonna be chief accountant there. So he threw me into the deep end. Uh, they were having some reorganization there. It was a CDC company. And one of the senior accountants moved to another uh, company and so on. So I had to go and look after the accounting function and see them through the year end accounting process and the audit and so on, threw me to the deep end. So that was a major experience. Took me, it was an out of the box experience, which was very good, okay? Another example I have is uh, um, in 1998, I was sent on secondment now to the Southampton office of, uh, of KPMG in the UK. Fantastic experience, two years. When I came back, I was, I was sent to Mopatni Copper Mines for another secondment as for three, four months as head of finance at the Mufliya division. Again, that was an out of, the, out of the box experience. Okay, fine, I'd worked for the mines before, so I had a bit of an idea. But this was different. Uh, running an operating mine is very different from sitting at, uh, at head office in an accounting function. Yeah. yeah. And then I've had other experience. So I think to, you need to um, keep people engaged and excited and give them different experiences. Obviously, 30 years is a stretch. There's only, there are only so many different experiences you can give to people. <laughs> and usually for 30 years, it's, it's partners who stayed on. But uh, give people enriched experiences, new experiences, encourage them to be innovative, encourage them to bring new ideas and change things around. Keep them engaged, otherwise people will do burnout. We all suffer from burnout from time to time. Yeah. What, what, what do you think makes people become bad bosses? There are just some people who have got the bad, wrong attitude, they shout at you and I've had conversations with some people who you don't even want to go to work in the morning because you, the boss will shout, what, what, they belittle you. Yeah. And people have to deal with that every day. And now it's stress and you can't even work. Your performance is not up there, because not because of you, but because of you know the person that you report to. And I read somewhere that um, your boss has um, a stronger effect on your health than, you know, 
um, what, what was that again? Your, your, your boss has this, like, the, your, your health, really. You find you're losing weight, you know, not because you're not eating, but because of your boss. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that, that's a tough one. Um, co- combination of things. It could be uh, maturity or immaturity of uh, the same bosses, uh, lack of uh, empathy uh, in those people, uh, lack of uh, emotional intelligence and soft skills training in those people themselves. And for some, it's just basically their personalities, uh, which is unfortunate. But uh, there are ways of remedying uh, those. People can go for help, uh, for coaching, and so on and so forth. I think the best, the, 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 the last thing you want is to have a, a, a bad boss uh, being terrified of going for work. And which is why as bosses, I think we underestimate uh, the impact of what we say and how we say it. Okay, so it's no longer an excuse to say, no, this is the way I am. This is where I was, I was wired. Uh, we have to be a bit more conscious on how we talk to people, how we engage with people. Even if you're going to discipline someone uh, and give them tough love, it's got to be done in a certain way, uh, which will not make someone terrified or, or want to leave uh, right away. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done. From my generation, uh, Generation X and the baby boomers, we were used to tough love. Okay, We were used to our bosses scolding us or telling us off and so on. So it's natural to think, well, that's the way things should be done. And then you do the same. But things are changing. Uh, the way you treat a, a baby boomer and a Generation X is not how you're going to treat a millennial or a Gen Z, or whatever it is that you, you call them these days. So it's things like that. We've got to be mindful. Uh, we've got to uh, be emotionally intelligent uh, of who we're dealing with. Yeah, because it all starts at the top. Uh, and it's important to set the right tone uh, at the top. And so we can progress for everyone, including me. Okay, so so working progress for me to make sure that I'm I'm working on uh, on these things. All right, being CEO, th- there are things people see. You know the perks, you know the nice cars, <laughs> the good office, the corner office, and whatnot. Yeah, what is it that it actually takes to be CEO that most people may never even get to? They they never get to see. They'll never get to know about. What do you go through as a CEO? You've heard the story that, uh, saying that it's lonely at the top. Eh? Yeah, 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 it's true. Because uh, who are you going to talk to? Uh, Fine, if you're in a multinational organization, like, say, for me, uh, I've got uh, this regional leadership I can talk to, but it's it's still not the same. It's long at the top. So um, to be uh, an effective CEO, you've got to be able to introspect, know your limits, know what's going on inside you. You've got to be able to come out of yourself. When you are annoyed about something, upset about something, you will recognize that I'm annoyed about something and come out to yourself, okay, how am I going to deal with this? Who am I going to talk to? It's important to have a supportive system. Um, uh, if, if you're married, it would be nice if your, your spouse gives you that kind of support, uh, emotional support. Uh, if you're not, you need to find some other sort of anchor to help you out. You need to also be able to chill and relax. You need to have friends as well. Okay, you need to have uh, some, you know, unofficial advisors uh, in, in the market. Uh, I've got a few uh, big boys in the, the Zambian <laughs> business circle that, that I talk to from time to time, maybe once in a year or once in two years, but we do talk. And I ask them, bouncing, oh, uh, I, why don't think about that, think about that. They're not pres- prescriptive, but they're there to help you unlock what may be blocking you in your mind. So it's important to... Uh, be willing to be able to talk to people and let people know that, uh, look, I've got an issue. Obviously, you can't tell them everything. So work is confidential, but in broad terms, then they can help you out. Yeah, Not just there, even family members, you know, uh, those of you that are religious, church circles or whatever, mosque circles or whatever. Um, yeah, but it's important to be, to be teachable and talk to people and don't bottle things up in yourself all the time, okay? Some people have got that rare ability to do so. Uh, I do so to, to a great extent to uh, introspect and sort of work things out myself. But there are times when I say, uh-uh, I need to talk to, uh, to someone. You know what they say, a problem, share, a problem shared is a problem halved. 
there's great truth in that saying. Great, great truth in that saying. You, you mentioned wife. I've got a trick question. Mm. Um, do you think a single person can thrive in your job? And why I'm asking that is because I've heard that sometimes they want to make you see you because you're not married. Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I <laughs> don't worry. We'll see you one day. Um, no, no, no. no. Uh, a single person can make it uh, in the job. Uh, the, the, well, I don't know about certain jobs. I don't know. But uh, in, in my profession, yes, a single person can, can become uh, a CEO. Um, certain jobs, it could be an advantage because of the long hours. But then you, go, you lose that uh, maybe connection or human touch, and which is why I suppose people don't really, may not trust someone who's not married to understand the problems they are going through as a married subordinate. You know, they'll say, ah, I think he doesn't care or she doesn't care because he's not married or she's not married, doesn't have kids, blah, 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 blah. Th th there's always that danger, okay? But objectively speaking, someone who's uh, single should still be able to execute the role of CEO Provided they, they've got all the issues we've talked about, technical competence, um, social intelligence, emotional intelligence, uh, networking skills, having empathy, being able to talk to people, grow up people, grow people, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter whether you're, you're single or married, because you can be as married as you want. You can have 10 wives, yeah? But if, you, if you've got none of these uh, skills or competences, <laughs> you'd be a terrible CEO. Uh, That's what I'm saying. It should not really be a, that much of a factor, in my view. Yeah, I'm asking because I'd, 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 I've obviously heard stories that sometimes some, at some level of responsibility, they want someone who's married, they've got a family and whatnot. And also, part of it goes to what you said about you're not able to relate. You know, it's like a supervisor who's never had a child. And you no, know, I'm at under five, the child is not feeling well. They think you're just using the kid as an excuse because <laughs> they cannot relate. Um, and I heard a story about this, this gentleman who was like there was a promotion coming. And at the same time, he was sort of like going through a divorce. But then he said, no, let's try and delay the divorce until after, you know, my promotion. Because they felt strongly that... Some people feel that because if you can't run a home, can you run a business? You know, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. That's the, and that's why I asked, because... Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I don't think that should hold water, because uh, I've worked with uh, people who are single and who've gone through divorces, and they're still... Mm -hmm work uh, uh, effectively at their role. No, I'm not saying a divorced person is not effective. <laughs> I'm just saying at the... <laughs> yeah, no, obviously, I know, I know, I know people who are divorced who have you yeah. know, done very well. Yeah. But they just felt like, you know, this may... Because also, you know, sometimes uh, some people would make a decision based on emotion, you know. Um, maybe, for example, you find that the one making the decision about who's promoted is a woman. Then the story is, no, he just he left his wife, he dumped his wife. Then, you know, because of that, they feel like you're not the... Because, like I said, others are very objective in their assessment. Yeah. Others also have got that human thing. You can't run away from it. You know, like it's it's there. Like they feel like, no, that one is cheated. So because of that, they feel like, no, I think we'll give it to this one. He's loyal. <laughs> yeah, All that's those, people yeah. now uh, projecting yeah. their, you know, personal biases and so on, which is normal. Uh, and it's something that has to be uh, dealt with. Uh, but I think for me, the issue of the values that you have is much more important than whether you're single or married or divorced and so on. Uh, obviously, I suppose being married is, is, uh, is first prize, but even people who are not in that position should still be able to, to deliver, still be able to show empathy, still be able to bring up their teams and engage with their teams and with the marketplace. You've been in KPMG 30 years. What, 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 what two values would you say sustained you during this period? Integrity. I think is a, is a, is a key value, uh, doing what you say you're going to do and doing what you said you're going to do. I think that's a key thing. You got to be, you must have integrity. You must have credibility. I think that's a key, key, key value. And the focus on quality as well, quality of services, uh, to your clients, you, know, you have to deliver quality deliverables. You have to ensure that your teams, also deliver quality. So for me, those are pretty integral. Quality and integrity. I want to talk and about in all things in my profession, integrity comes as number one. All right. I want to talk about accountability. Um, yeah. It's easy to be accountable to someone else. Mm -hmm. Very difficult to be accountable to yourself. 
Yeah. Um, someone like you, obviously you're a CEO. I, I don't know if KPMG has a board that you report to or it's outside the country. But mostly, um, it's easy for me to be accountable to my boss. But for example, where I have no boss. Or sometimes, yes, I may have a boss, but the standards I've set for myself. I always tell people, um, if you say today and you tell me that, look, Sui, I'm going to Kitwe. After two hours, I'll call you and say, Mr. Kaziman, how far are you? Ah, no, I'm at Levy. Then I know there's a problem somewhere because you shared with me your, your goal and now I'm holding you accountable. But you said you, you're going to the copper belt. Yeah. But where I tell myself I'm going to the copper belt and, and only I know I'm going to the copper belt, even if I, I'm at Levy, like it, it's not a big deal. No one knows. No one's going to shout at me. How yeah. do you keep yourself accountable? Moral compass. Uh, it comes down to integrity. It comes down to who you are. And uh, this is not something that you learn when you're a CEO. No. It's something that's inculcated into you from childhood. Yeah? If your parents uh, taught you the proper values, your parents or your guardians or your family, whoever brought you up, brought you the proper values, that should not be an issue. It's not something that you learn when you're a CEO. No, it's not. I'll tell you what. I play golf. It's one of my favorite pastimes. Yeah? I'll know uh, who's got integrity from what they do on the golf course. If someone is going to cheat on the golf course, whether or not he, he, he or she is a CEO or, or a chairman of a board, whatever, if they cheat on the golf course, then I know they're probably doing something wrong at work as well or in their family lives. And this thing comes from childhood. It's not something you learn as a CEO. Uh -uh. Integrity, moral values, having a moral compass, that's developed when you're a child, between the ages of one to five. Remember what the Jesuits say. The Jesuits say, give me a child between the age of one up to five or six, and I'll make a man out of him. Simple. Once you miss that uh, crucial stage, you will lose people. It will take a while to bring them back, to mold them back to where you want them to be. So it's something that comes from upbringing. If a young man comes to you and says, sir, how can I become a CEO? What are you saying to them? I'll say, young man, are you sure? I'll ask them, why do you want to become a CEO? Do you know what it takes to be a CEO? And uh, what it means to be a CEO? Do you know the kind of pressure you're under? The loneliness, I won't use those words, eh? but that's the measure of it. The kind of pressure you're under, the loneliness, the pressure, uh, when you are CEO, it's you to make sure that everyone gets paid eh? at the end of the month. The buck stops with you. When you are CEO, you are face of the organization. When you are CEO, they'll say, oh, in fact, some, some entities are associated with someone. Oh, th this company, oh, you mean this one. That company, oh, you mean that one. That's just the way it is. So it's a major, major responsibility. So I'd be interested to know whether that person uh, understands the level of responsibility. And if they do, second is, well, what plan do they have, they themselves, do they have to get up to that stage? Obviously, you should take them through the process. Uh, you go to have the adequate training. Uh, if, you, if, you're, if you're in an accounting firm, you need to be qualified. You need to have a Zika practice certificate and so on and so forth. You need to have the really great experience and so on and so forth, depending on the organization. Okay, that that is a given. You you need to uh, demonstrate and develop uh, leadership skills, soft skills, presentation skills, networking. All those soft skills you need to develop them over time. It's not something that you develop uh, overnight. Now there are different kinds of CEOs. Eh? My son can finish university today, and then the next day he'll start his own firm and call himself a CEO. You understand? Yeah. And employ one person. So that's a CEO. But in this context. We're talking about uh, major uh, established organizations, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So here, that's why it's important to ensure that someone has the right qualifications, uh, right attitude, uh, right experience, and all these other uh, competencies. But attitude is very important. And someone should be able to influence others. Leadership is about influence. Yeah. If you don't have influence, you can be technically good and so on and so forth, but you end up just becoming a, a, a manager. And being CEO is one thing. Being a leader of an organization is another thing. You can have a CEO in an organization, but the leader is actually someone else. You understand? 
Yeah, you can have a chairman of the board, but the leader of the board is actually someone else. So I think maybe what you want to talk about is being the leader of organization because CEO is just a title at the end of the day. But are you really the leader of the organization or are you just sitting in the CEO's office, but you're not the real leader? So leadership has got various, various competencies that you have to develop. And that's what I'll be engaging the young man about and hopefully um, guide him or the young man guide her, write books to read, who to engage with, you know, relationships uh, are important. Your network is never neutral. I've said this maybe three, four times already. Your network is never neutral. Okay, who's in your network influences who you are. They can either bring you up or bring you down. You should read a book called Talent is Never Enough. John C. Maxwell. I always talk about that book. It's a small 100-pager book or 120 pages book. Out of the many hundred books, it always sticks in my mind. Yeah. So those are some of the things I'll be uh, discussing uh, with a young man or the young woman that wants to become CEO. But I would encourage them because it means they're putting themselves forward and not hiding in a shell. And that's what this country needs. People need to uh, come out and make themselves uh, available. I was having a, I've got a, 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 a group of friends. We have these discussions. And uh, one of them, he keeps on saying, Pandi, Simfuku, he was saying, our generation will not really done justice uh, to this country. The generation that was born between 1965 and 1980, we've not, not done much. Yeah, we've just been floating around. And we'd like to see the next generation do much more, make much more of an impact on society and make Zambia a better place to be in. All right. At retirement, when you look back at your career, when you leave KPMG and, you know, I don't know what your plans are if you'll be sitting at a farm somewhere. What has to happen for you to say, you know what, I think I could not have done more than this, I've done my part. How do you measure your success when you look back? How do you measure that, okay, I have lived up to my true potential? Tough question. Um, obviously, the young person will probably think about, oh, lived up to his potential. Oh, I've got so many farms, so many cars, so much money in the bank account, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But that's not, that's not it. The, the real thing is really is uh, uh, if you've been in an organization for so long and you've been in the organization for so long, who are you leaving behind are in a position of leadership? And your succession plan actually worked. Uh, when you leave, are things going to crumble? Or when you leave, is the organization get a, going to get even stronger and better? driven by the people you left behind. I think that's a true measure of, uh, of leadership. That's what I would, I, would, I would call term success. If after I've left, my firm grows bigger. Not just my firm, but wherever else I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm involved in. Even family, if my children do better than I do, I think that's a sign of success. Thank you, Mr. Kazimak. You're and thank you so much for your time. Um, I think I've learned a lot from, from this conversation. Uh, I just see you as the thought leader, you know, on the economy and the budget and whatnot. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good to reintroduce myself to you through this, uh, through this conversation. But thank you, guys, for your time. You're welcome. All right. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.